You're listening to the Australian Hunting and Beyond podcast with Matt. And when you hear this intro, you know that Frank's on. And we're going to be chatting about hunting, fishing, camping, and everything else that the outdoors has to offer. Let's get into it. Let's get straight into it. All right, we've got Frank back. I uh, We are fresh off hunt camp up there with the Hunter's Campfire boys. I can see you wearing that blaze orange hat with the Hunter's Campfire logo, which is a great hat, and it's nicknamed the Frank after you. Jeez, that was good fun. Oh, great trip. Absolutely great trip, Matt. Good to be back. And, uh, yeah, no, still wish I was there. Still wish I was there, mate. Well, I mean, technically, you nearly didn't get out. I heard there was a bit of issues with you uh, getting a bit bogged and needing some help, mate. Is that true? Well, you know, I did have highway terrain tyres on a stock vehicle. So, yes, yes, I did. Plus, I was towing a trailer. So, unfortunately, I did get stuck. But uh, the good thing is every man his dog had something that had pulled me out with. And cheers to Rob Camp from Athena Spatial. He pulled me out with his new winch on his uh, on his vehicle. So thank you, Rob, for that. Oh, Rob, he's a great bloke. And if you haven't, check out Athena Spatial because, man, that map for Nundle, it was brilliant. So just for our listeners, if you haven't checked it out, you can purchase his maps on Avenza and they basically are like using Google Earth on Avenza while you're in the forest. It was absolutely sensational and he's done such a fantastic job of putting in roads and creek lines and it makes such a big difference when you're in the forest. Oh, yeah, no, definitely helped me out with, you know, finding spots to uh, check out with young Joan. It was um, massive, massive help. I couldn't recommend them enough to everyone. They're just bloody great, great to have in hand. You know where everything is and you can just – and it doesn't go towards your map count. So you can still have your three maps on there plus your Athena Spatial maps. Yeah, it's brilliant. The only thing is it's not – it doesn't comply with DPI regulations. But I just found I was running the normal Nunder one from the DPI and then just had that as a backup and it was just so easy. And, yeah, man, it was good. I'm so happy. I did that too. And, like, even Rob does a uh, little tutorial on YouTube on how to actually put those little pink spots into his maps, if you like, and you can change them as a layer every single time, if you like, too, as well. That, that was really handy as well. Yeah, no, really good stuff there. So good on you, Rob. Keep that up, mate. And I, I look forward to seeing some more forests slowly getting in there. He's got a pretty decent list for the majority of the major ones, I should say, over in um, in here in New South Wales. So not bad for a Queenslander. We won't hold that against him. Oh, he usually was a New South Welshman, but what drove him to the madness to move up there? It's, been, yeah, it's, it's his issue, I suppose. <laughs> well, I mean, you probably shouldn't talk bad about him after he pulled you out of getting stuck. I would have <laughs> no, left I, you. I'm just putting it out there. Bad. Never, never would talk bad about young Rob. He, he makes a great <laughs> jaffle as well. So, mate, there is so much to just cover off on mm. Deer Camp. It was – I was tossing up whether I could get up there or not, and I'm so glad I did. The snowies is probably where I spent my time, but getting up to check out a new forest in Nundul was awesome. And been around so many great people up there. I had an absolute blast just bouncing ideas off each other, talking. Yeah, geez, it was good. I mean, well, one of the things I did, I was really shocked at, was the amount of leeches that place has. Holy crap. Yeah, mate, they are everywhere. They are, buddy. They're a curse. They're an absolute curse, no matter where you turn. But people got some very inventive ways in getting rid of them. So that was quite exciting to see different... um, all different type of manners that, that they uh, extinguish the, those uh, leeches off themselves. It was pretty good to watch. What was your favourite way of people trying to not get leeches around them? Oh, the uh, Anthony there, he um, <laughs> he grabbed the salt, he put out his little uh, camping mat that he has underneath the stretcher there, and he absolutely covered it in salt. It looks like it snowed there. <laughs> and every, every leech that went onto that map just, just literally just – thawed out into jerky straight away there was that much salt around <laughs> but no leeches on him no leeches on him i know one of the nights we're in uh the sort of community area there man i looked down and besides the blood dripping down most people's legs there was just movement on the floor there was just there was oh, i can't believe how many there were you'd just go through like a little walk through the bush and you'd look down and there's like they're just on you boots just yeah. plenty of them so it was a i've never had a forest or even any oh man i've done the shoal haven i've done so many different areas camping and 
bushwalking, and I have never seen so many leeches in all my life. It was insane. They were quite prolific around the place, and yeah, it just, I found a little bit of salt on them did wonders, but also spraying the boots and gaiters with a bit of Bushman's. But that was the best thing. Bushmans inside the gators, I found, didn't have any problems after that of them sneaking underneath and attaching themselves to my person. Yeah, no, that was oh, – I was doing the same thing. A bit of Bushmans or off or any of those, if you just threw it on the inside of the gators and on the boots, I found they uh, didn't really – I think I got bitten three times and that was before I started doing that because I was just like, eh, I'm right here. But at one stage there, I had the gators on. I could feel them. I, fe- I could feel it th- underneath my gator moving yep. my trouser as it was moving around. So oh. it was, uh, yeah, they got, their, <laughs> they got their money's worth, I think. There was a lot yeah, of blood uh, just getting around there. You know, they find their ways. They find their ways, especially if you start making some stomping noises, they start searching it out. You just see them coming for you. Yeah, oh, it's crazy. So let's uh, let's talk about it. I, you know, shout out to Hurls and Jono and, and also Marky wasn't there for this one, but both those boys were. Yep, and yep. what a great job of organizing such a big group to get together and go for the hunt. It was it was a great few days. I was just <sighs> disappointed I couldn't spend more time there. Obviously, it's hard with the kids, but, you know, that was a good four-day sort of stretch for me, which was nice. I know a couple of boys would be there, you know, for the full week like yourself. And it was really – there was just a lot of good stuff going on. And one of the things I did like was – they had a big basically map where people circled and said, hey, I'm going to be hunting in this area, this area, this area. So a bit of safety there and the majority of people hunting in the forest were obviously for that. So it was pretty much everyone in camp was hunting in the forest. So that was quite a good thing and I felt that was a much better way to do it. So that was a really good idea and I think you organized the map, didn't you? Yeah, no, well, uh, young Rob actually got it printed out. I just picked it up That's all I did but – it was really good for knowing where everyone was and it helped out in the case there was some sort of situation where we need to go looking for someone. We know what area they roughly be in as well. It's more of a safety thing, really. You're not shooting over top of each other and you know who's in what area and stuff like that. And like sometimes, you know, when you're hunting and then you can hear a shot, and you know, it comes from the east and you go, oh, you know, such and such might have been lucky this afternoon. And when you get to camp, how'd you go? So like, oh, yeah, no, nah, got one. Here he is here hanging up. Oh, fantastic stuff. Like, that also helps as well, just just knowing where your neighbour is going to be and stuff like that and who the neighbour is. So, yeah, that worked out really good. It's a real safety thing. and You know where everyone is and who's in what area. That, that really did help out a lot, I feel, with feeling more comfortable being in the forest. Yeah, and look, on top of that, uh, what I did love is they had the Zolios there and I was lucky enough, I know you were as well, that we were able to play around with the Zolio for a couple of days. And Yeah, no. Man, I I wasn't sold on it before I actually had a play with it, and now I am. I think it's an absolute great bit of gear. The ability to message each other, loved ones, because there was no reception there. And correct, it yeah. had this sneaky little feature that you can set up where it checks in every, I think, six minutes uh, and sends your GPS location to whoever you put in as the email user. So I've got my thoughts about that. Is, well, I know exactly what your thoughts are. <laughs> so I've got my thoughts. So let's get into the the hunting part. Right. Man, really good. I jumped in there. I know you you found some good areas, but I, on the first day, got in there. Jeez, I covered some ground. Very hilly terrain. Very shocked that speaking of hurls and talking about those, you know, the boys being up on those, that terrace overlooking creeks and, and watching the girls and there was nothing yep. down there. So I, I went through all that and just went, you know what, this isn't, nothing's here. So I'm going to go up and try and find some higher spots and a bit of flatter terrain and see if they're hanging around up there. And, and that's where they were. So I was able to, in that first morning hunt, found a heap of different rub trees. Could not find a scrape for the life of me, but rub trees galore. And then I sort of went, you know what, I'm going to call it and, and head back to camp, try and get some sleep uh, because we got in, I got in late the night in the dark and it was absolutely torrential rain. So that wasn't a – it was a pain in the backside. So I think we just – I just got camp set up and it hit, uh, yep. which put a bit of a dampener on socialising and, and meeting people, which, um, you know, that is is what it is. Can't control the weather. So found those rubs and then I went down and I found this nice little trail and there was a really good glassing straight across to this other gully and I was like, you know what, 
facing the sun in the morning, you know, near the rubs on the way, I can just see this is a really nice little patch. Yep, yep. And so I decided I got I had the secateurs there and I was going to clip a few saplings to make a nice quiet entrance into this area. And I've lifted the gun up nearly, you know, just under my shoulder just to, to hold it while I was leaning back to get the snips. And yep. what I was running, just so people know, is I was running a 12-litre Mountain Designs pack and then I was running a Hunter's Element bum bag system. So I had them just sort of tucked into one of the little pockets there that I could pull out pretty quickly. And as I was grabbing and pulling that out, well, I didn't even get that far. I've put them down. I've sort of noticed, you know, 100 metres, 80, 100 metres away across the gully, this faint outline of a deer. And I've sort of just slowly turned my head and I'm just looking at this buck and he's just looking <laughs> in my direction. So I froze. Pinja. He, well, he must have seen me moving beforehand, but obviously yeah. being decked out in camo, having a lot of those saplings behind me would have completely broken up my silhouette. So I knew yeah. something was there, but he, I don't think he could work it out. And the wind was in my favour. Thermals were good. So he literally just stood there looking. Yeah, I wonder if he thought you were another buck. If you're in the sapling zone, you're moving around a bit. I wonder if you well, thought you were another I'd buck. Well, I'd stopped. Yeah. Well, maybe, I, but I'd stopped at this stage. So he, he, yeah. was, he was locked on. And I, I honestly think it was a good five minutes that we were just standing there and I was just watching him because I was hurting. By the end of it, I was like the the awkward position that my arm was. It was right like someone, you know, when you used to like as a kid, you'd get someone's hand up behind their back and pull it up. No, the and chicken was, wing, yeah. Yeah, it was like that. That's like what I was sort of doing because I'd had to tuck in and then I was too worried to move. And then same as the rifle was up. So I'm <laughs> holding it in this, <laughs> I must have looked like a complete tool. But I didn't want to move because I'm like, oh my God, you know, that I don't want to don't want to shoot him. He's a good size buck too. I was quite happy with the look of him going, This is this is awesome if I get the chance to have a shot here. And after that sort of five minutes, he turned his head and he sort of put his head up and I don't know if he was just having a bit of a sniff of the leaves. So I just, I, I had to do it. And I just moved both arms to try and quickly get it. And he, he just was straight back onto me. He must've been doing it, watching me out of the peripherals. And yeah, as soon yeah. as I moved, he just targets straight back. And then he, he didn't spook. He just trotted off slowly the way he came back into the brush. And I was like, okay, this is good. Well, you know, I found the rubs. Uh, where I saw him, it's about 140 meters roughly to where it was. So in the vicinity, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, need to find these scrapes. But uh, so that was the plan for the next Arvo it was going to yep. be, uh, sorry, that Arvo was to go back and, and try and set up to, to get him, which sort of didn't play out that way. But yeah, I mean, so here's my thoughts. Hmm. What can I say? <laughs> so after I found him and let people know, oh, yeah, I spotted him. Yep. It just so happens that even though we'd had these penciled off map, there was another hunter who was in there looking and found the scrapes only 100 metres from where I saw him. And yeah. my thoughts, and I've got, I've got a bit of evidence here. I will say this. I'm of the opinion Hurls was giving out my GPS coordinates. <laughs> on Zolio. <laughs> and I, I reckon he, he sent Michael in and said, hey, he saw a buck here. Just Go and snipe that. it. Because yep. James Gregg will be really happy to know he's no longer the buck thief. We've got a new person who's taken that title. And well done, Michael. He shot the buck. He uh, within, I reckon, probably 50 metres of where I saw it. Yeah, And right. he got it. He's uh, the new buck thief. What can I say? Good, Just good job, Michael. Just the side of the hill. Well done, mate. All right, look, I, I remember I was in camp and Michael came in and he just yelled out, Frankie. And I'm like, hey, mate, what's happening? He goes, I got him. I said, what? You got him? I was like, Yo, way. And I ran over and had a look at him. I'm like, oh, well done. And he was super excited. He was telling me how much he was pacing up and down. He was happy as. And I thought, this is what it's all about. This is Hunt Camp 101 right here. And I thought, this is such a magical moment. And he was so ecstatic and I was so happy for him. High fives all around. Everyone come out, their tents, and just, you know, high five on him. Well done, mate. What I can say is when he did tell me the story and 
yeah, I'm sure he can back it up. But he said that he shot him on his scrape. He came over to the scrape and he was messing around on it and he shot him on the scrape. So good on him for actually getting the deer like that. That, that That's definitely uh, something oh, every awesome. hunter needs to do. Yeah. We actually went back together. So when, when he came in and said, oh, look, I accidentally came in and found these scrapes just off roughly the area hunting, I was like, hey, it's public land, man. You can do what you want. Yeah. And I said, how about we go there the next Arvo and we do a sit and wait. So he sat off the scrapes and I went and sat off the rub trees. Oh. Oh, yeah. And I made a, made a big error there. I was downwind of a dead pig and then oh, moved multiple nice. times and the wind just kept coming. But, geez, it was painful. But, look, is what it is. And, uh, no, no luck, unfortunately. And, and then we got hit with the rain and getting out of there in the dark with pouring rain. It was, it was fun. We had a, a good experience with that one. But, uh, no, most definitely – Man, I think he did it the next day. I took off and went and explored another part of the forest, and he was he, you know, was successful in knocking him over. So well done, Michael. Great job, mate. I'm uh, really happy for you. Yeah, no, he done really well. Done really well. He's gonna, he's uh, getting it mounted now. So good on him for doing that. And yeah, that's his first one, first proper one for the state forest. Good on him. Yeah, it's a ripper. Talking of bucks. Yes, which one you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you elaborate. <laughs> Wow, where can we go from here? Well, there was plenty of deer seen on the week that I was there at the hunters' camp. Uh, first day is always scout day, so you make as much noise as you need. But go and find the sign. Go find the run pads. Go find the rub trees. Go find all that sort of stuff. Get out there amongst it and know every single piece of that one square kilometre, as Hell says. Make sure you know that one piece of square kilometre really well so you know where the trails in and out are, where all activity is happening, and you know where you can – stand to see everything so that was a great idea got to my location that i actually scouted on rob's um map the athena spatial map walked literally 200 meters i was going to head to the east uh joan started indicating to the west uh following a ground trail so i followed her down and would have been i probably snaked a snake down this particular side of the um this this side of a hill and got to this little clearing. And I mean little clearing, it's probably 30 metres in diameter, 40 metres in diameter maximum. But that's where I found the first rub trees and all the scrapes. Or I say Joan found them all. She was smelling everything. And I was taking photos of Mark and them on the uh, events of ma- onto Rob's map, sorry. Then she took me uh, further to the, to the north. So I followed all that. And... Um, Long and behold, we get through scrape after scrape after scrape. I think I found, I think it was 15 scrapes I found in a 200 meter stretch. Uh, at the very end, got this lovely clover patch that had, it looked like a, a, a cooch lawn that you play bowls on, flat as, uh, and it was long and narrow. So probably about 60 meters long and about, I'll say, 30 meters wide. And at the very end of that was a really big red deer wallow. So that was really good to to see that. And Joan was really excited about smelling around there. Even got a photo of her sitting next to it to show how big it was. That was pretty exciting. So thought of a red coming in and wallowing in that was, yeah, that was definitely a, a draw card for me. So uh, anyway, I, I cut heaps of bluegum saplings. I even set up a little hide. There was this beautiful cut stump about 40 meters away from one of the one of the scrapes at the very start. So I put a little hide around that with some cut off blue gum saplings and just sat there and and thought I'll just watch over this in the morning and afternoon and if I get bored here then we'll go over to the the wallow and see how that pans out. So yeah, next day um, went down with Joan. The great thing about having an indicating dog is that you may not see absolutely nothing, but they can they smell everything. So coming down this S path down the side of the hill, she starts winding and the great thing about the map is i can bring up literally bring up the map put it on her nose and turn it the way she's pointing and i can see that she's pointing at the scrape at the very first one so i know that there is a buck there so i now know there is a deer at the scrape all i gotta do is ninja my way in there find him there shoot him deal done great pick up the buck go go back to camp a champion and go get my knives that i've won so i thought so <laughs> make my way down and at this, time, at this point in time, I get down the very edge of these blue gum saplings that I cut a track into, and she was winding extremely hard right in front of me, and she didn't want to move. So that usually means like she wants to hold point as, as like she knows it's very, very close. Me knowing that, 
I was just waiting to see any movement. So I saw the very end of the saplings before I enter them and looked down this channel and she was just holding point. So I, I was looking, looking for binoculars, trying to see any antler movement, anything like that. And mind you, like this thing, it's thick as in there. It is really thick in there. Blue gum saplings everywhere on the other side of this little clearing. So I inch my way forward bit by bit by bit, get to the very end of those blue gum saplings. And I thought I might just poke my head out and just turn just to see what's happening out to the uh, to the west. And as I've done that, this buck has jumped up or would have been about 50 to 60 metres away. And he was inside the blue gum saplings. So by the time I brought the rifle up, I've swung past him and I've just seen the back of his body. He was a menile with uh, a grey. He was in the rut phase, that rut colour phase with the grey uh, neck on him. So I seen that, couldn't tell you how big his antlers were because I didn't, all I seen was the, the blue gums moving around them. But by the time I brought, brought the rifle back down on him, uh, that was it, he was, he was gone. So that was, that was um, very um, heartbreaking to see, knowing Joan had done all this work. And so she got a good pat, but I felt like I'd let her down. Something severe. Um, so he wasn't going to come back to that scrap that afternoon. So I thought I'd contour around and, Went around a bit more, but nothing else happened that afternoon. Then um, it would have been the next day, uh, Anthony arrived. Cousin Anthony arrived at the hunters' camp, which is great. And I was having a chat to him about what I found and everything, and he said, let's go sit out off the Red Wallow. So I went and sat off the Red Wallow, and nothing happened off the Red Wallow. So <laughs> there's, there's one, there's one uh, afternoon burnt. The next morning, I wanted to give that place a bit of a rest. And I found a sneaky little cut trail through the pines that forestry had made. So I followed that, and we had seen a heap of deer on that trail. Uh, Joan winded hard where two pine forests meet. There was this lovely bit of nature strip, natural um, timber in between. Um, and we went over Little Creek, followed her around the path, and we seen a deer just go over the top of the hill. So I let Anthony jump in front and let him go a bit more forward. Than me, he got over the ridge and he was looking over to the the west. I went over the ridge and Joan started winding hard from the east. As we got over, there was a massive, massive pine tree. It would have been about oh, 30 meters long by about two meters in diameter. And she was trying to wind over the top of that. And so I couldn't see past it. And there was no branches on it for me to jump up over and have a look at it, over it. So I just trying to sneak a bit more forward and edge a bit wide, edge way a bit more forward than that. And I thought I was getting to the end of it where I could actually sneak in and see them, but the wind just moved just that little bit, and I could tell because Joan just turned instantly and looked straight at me, and that's usually the wind's gone the other way. And sure enough, I just heard this stumbling of footsteps and just got over to the end of the pine just to see you know, three of these does just take off down the path and off they went into the uh, into the thick scrub down the other side of the track there so anyway uh met up with anthony again we walked around up on top of a track did another two case to get on top of this hill and i said to him, we'll make we'll, we'll walk down through the pines again um at the very top and it'll take us down to where the car was and so we got to the top there and we were a bit we we're a bit bushed so we sat down and had a chat we sat down for about half an hour and um you wouldn't believe it matt as we're sitting there this young buck <laughs> jumps up onto the track probably about 40, 50, 20 metres. I could throw a rocket and hit it. That's how close it was. So you ask judgment on how close the deer is because there's heaps of speculations about how close it was. I couldn't touch it with my hand just in case anyone ever brings that up. I didn't, couldn't, wasn't able to do that. But anyway, it uh, was facing away. By the time I got on the track, it was facing away, pulled the rifle up and had the rifle on four power and it pretty much took up two-thirds of the rifle scope. As it was walking away, I, th I thought about putting it – square on the on the top of his tail and then i thought no i'll go a bit higher squeeze the shot and i've pulled the shot and it's it's pretty sure it's gone right into a pine tree somewhere but the amazing thing is the buck didn't do anything he just kept on walking like nothing happened like it was a lightning strike and that was it so i took two steps to the left after reloading to take another shot and was as soon as I took the two steps left, he's turned around, seen me, and he's just on one dive over the edge. And off he went to the abyss. And that was probably my best shot at getting a deer that trip, pun unintended. 
So I was quite gutted after that, as you can imagine. Uh, Jones looking for a new owner as we speak. So I thought Rob had that. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I think she'll take anyone at the moment, considering my <laughs> performance. So yeah, that was just one of those things. One of those things, Maddie. And I was just, I was. Anyway. All right. So I want to unpack that one a little bit. You were sitting there talking with Anthony. When we're saying you're talking, is it whispering or is it just talking like normal? No, we're just having a normal conversation. We weren't yelling at each other, but we're just having a normal conversation like you and I are now. Yeah. See, I. I am more and more thinking the more experience I get with deer and I don't think the noise sometimes is as prolific in causing an issue. I feel if there is noise and sight, they're off. But yep. I think that if you are just you – know, I'm not saying, again, but some people have taken – I've mentioned about shutting the car door and shooting something within 50 metres, which happened, and – that wasn't done deliberately. We were hiking in a fair way. I didn't think there'd be anything there, but they were there. I don't think that sometimes – now, not saying all deer are like that. I, I do feel that's fallow, and I'm talking mainly about fallow as opposed to, to reds and samba and the like, but fallow, I, I sort of refer to them as the Labrador of the deer species. I just think if it, it's noise and it's sight, they're gone. If it's wind, you're gone. If they sent you out, you're out. Like they're yeah. just – Hundred yep. percent, but if you if you make a little bit of noise, it's not the game killer that I think. You know, a lot of people think it is. If you are doing that in isolation, you know, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. As as we're walking through this path, there were black cockatoos and they were taking pine cones off the trees and dropping them all around us. So they were making a big crash once they hit the floor. And we're talking pine forest was eerily quiet in there, and so all you hear is these cockatoos chewing pine cones, dropping them on the floor, and you know, as as we're moving through the forest, you can still hear them doing it, and that didn't bother the deer because obviously they were you know only about hundred meters away when Joe winded them. So yeah, I think they don't mind the noise every now and then. I think if you are bulldozing through the forest, I think they're gonna obviously look over and catch on to see what's going on. Yeah, but I think the odd stick breaking definitely not. It's the bush makes noise no matter where you go. So I feel yeah the odd the odd noise here and there, even at that point in time. At, during the rut, I think the young bucks are just a little bit less focused on what's happening around them, which is very task focused about getting to certain places. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what this buck happened with this buck. This buck was he actually he had something to he had somewhere to be and he wanted to be there and he was walking through and he like he he was cutting through forest and everything. He didn't take a path, he was he was cutting through forest, which you rarely see. Usually you see you see all the does walking along the paths or anything like that, but he was actually making a bee line somewhere when you cross that path. So, yeah, I think that the young bucks are a little um, little less attentive yep, at uh, that time of year. And I think the does are usually the ones that, that spot you more often than not in saying that, though. You know, you could be 60 metres away cracking sticks underfoot unless they actually look over and see you moving. I think that's what it is. They hear the noise, if they see you, then they'll take off. But, yeah, it's best, yeah. If you do crack a stick, sometimes it pays just to – Stop, have a quick look around. Don't see any ear movements, any flickering or any heads bobbing up and down. Then you're pretty much still good to keep on going on that route, I reckon. Yeah, I'd agree. I I just think that I've made some noise and still seen deer, but I've been relatively still. And I just think it's that combo. You know, even the the hunt down south where I missed that doe, there was two of them there and I was able to slowly go down, reload, and that wasn't a quiet thing. But they didn't take off. So I, I think it's got to be that combination. It's uh, yeah, more important, hunt into the wind. Make sure that wind is in your favour. It can be tricky sometimes because it swirls and that can give you up. So it's it's definitely the the main prerogative there. But look, on the, on the dog, wow. I uh, I had oh, so lucky. So again, shout out to, to Hurls and Jono. They took a few of the boys for a walk just yep. around camp to – show them what to look for because there was a, a mix of hunters, people with experience, people that were pretty brand new, and, and that was really good to see such a variety there. And we went for the wander, and I was lucky enough to watch Hurl's dog in action. That's the first time I've had an indicating dog or been there with an indicating dog, and just watching her and how she operated was absolutely brilliant. Thoroughly enjoyed that experience, just seeing how she moved, where 
picking things up. It's, man, it's a game changer. It's so cool to watch. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed that. And getting out there and going through and one of the things I've struggled with is finding beds. Yeah. Uh, and that was really good because we were able to find – we were able to sort of find one and go through where and why and, and Hurls and John are a wealth of knowledge and experience. So it was nice for me to be able to go out there and go, hey, all the things they were pointing out and showing, I go, hey, that, I, I knew that. By the beds thing, which is great because, as I said, I'm always yep. about learning. And the rest was just that reinforcement that, hey, yeah, all right, everything I'm doing is correct. And I've sort of felt that way for a while now that I, I know what the sign is, I know where it all is. It's just about – getting through and and hey this was the third new forest and this year three forests and unfortunately like yourself that last morning i missed a a little spiker and it's about 120 when i first saw him wind was good he's on the road so obviously had the rifle cleared magazine out not able to fire and I was going forward and back and just sort of tracking him but trying to catch him up and back off, catch him up, back off. So I got within 60 metres of him and then sort of pushed that back out to about 80 metres and he was browsing across the road to get into the pines. So I made the, I guess, plan to jump into the pines so that I could load the rifle, get ready and try and catch him up without making too much noise but put myself in a position that as he came across I might have the shot. The theory worked out pretty well because I got to the point where he was probably at about the 80 metre mark and I was able to get there in a pretty good position and wait for him to sort of keep coming across and I had a bit of a shooting lane there so I was pretty happy where the shooting lane was and then as he's coming across, I you know let out a bit of a doe call to try and pull him up, and it worked, a treat. Now, my problem was, like someone else at the camp, he stopped behind a bloody tree. <laughs> so, <laughs> tree in the forest? Damn it. Oh, man, I was just like a <laughs> little bit further, and he would have been perfect. It would have been a great shot, broadside, bit open, so I couldn't shoot. So I'm sitting there, and this was the interesting thing is he knew something was up because I'd given up the game, right, and he he was then alert as hell. And unfortunately, then he went to take off, and there was another spot that he was going through that gave me a bit of a shot, but, yeah, no good, just no. unfortunately. Oh, I was just like, damn it. But positive is I'm going to three state forests this year Three different state forests got on the deer in all the forests, knocked over two, missed a shot on the third. I'm pretty happy with how I'm traveling in the old state forest at the moment. Yeah, no, 2024 is a good year for you so far, Maddie. That's for sure. Yeah, no, it has been. I, you know, I, I'm a bit devo. I'd love to have got that third and said, hey, three in a row. They say good luck comes in threes, and yeah. that did not happen. Now, Talking of luck, oh, this was a costly trip for me, Frank. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to send the bill to the hunter's campfire because- What happened? Oh, man. So, look, I clocked up. I had a bit. I think I had a bit of a kill rate was up there, to be honest. Yep. I had two wallabies jump into the side of my ute mm-hmm. driving yep. around the forest. That was good. Um, they did bounce off into the bush. So I'm sure they still survive. I'm sure they they're probably there eating now. <laughs> they probably did. Um but then on the second morning, heading in, and I was going pretty slow. Roads are great up in Nundal, I will say that. They're fantastic. Yeah. Best roads I've been on in a state forest by far. And going only about 40 Ks because it was pretty dark, obviously, getting out there early and had the spotties and everything running. I come up to this sort of, not a turn, but just sort of slight little, like a little bend. On the left-hand side, this embankment that's higher than the car. Yep. And for some reason, this kangaroo decided that he was going to jump from that embankment to land into the middle of the road a metre in front (laughs) of my car. So I hit him with the bull bar, flush in the middle. Thanks for coming. Oh, he's damaged both my spotlights. The bull bar's been pushed back into the car. 
<laughs> so, oh, man, I just was like, and yet what was worse is it was only about 20 metres from a dead roo on the road. So it must be a bit of a hot spot there, I'll it tell you that be. much. And, uh, yeah, he took off into the bush. Now, who knows what happened, but he did some did some damage in the car. So that was, I was just spewing about that. You know, this is bloody hell. Like, can my luck get worse? Well, <laughs> hold the, dear, my beer. <laughs> the, the dear God said, hold on, we can show you more. Uh, so that last day, the, the weather was turning and coming in pretty bad. And the weather was up and down. It was quite wet. And uh, I didn't have the same problems as you getting out. My uh, my Triton just powered through, even with the trailer, powered through. That. Haven't you got mud tyres on your vehicle? All terrain, not mud. Oh, uh, no. Calm down. Uh, just a little bit more than you, all right? <laughs> got through that. <laughs> no, no, no problems whatsoever. Driving home at some stage, I must have kicked up a rock. Now, my camper trailer is a ute tub. So it's nice and high. It's got very good clearance, so it's good for full driving. And it's got a canopy on it. Now, the problem with that is there's the glass at the front of the canopy. Well, I've obviously kicked a rock up and shattered that window, haven't I? Which then followed. Like I wouldn't have been too unhappy that, hey, yeah, smashed window happens. Not the greatest of deals. Yeah, it's going to be cost me. It's going to be pain. But... I then had torrential rain to the point where I could not see 10 metres ahead of me <laughs> for a good hour and a half for the drive home. And the ute was like a swimming pool. Yep. The ute uh, was like a swimming pool. Man, it was just ridiculous. I got in there and just went, oh, man, not only do I now have to clean the whole thing out and try and dry it all out, but there was so many electronics because I was running my fridge in there and the battery oh. and – Oh man, it was that was annoying. I was just like the the luck there. It, it ended up being a pretty costly trip up there, that's for sure. But and then oh, what about my my awning that lasted the first night? Oh, yeah, <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> I have it. it. Look, it came with the yeah. with the trailer, just an old King's one. It had mold on it. I'd never opened it. I'll be honest. Before we got up there, and it was just to put over the the little cooking section, and. Yeah, the rain hit that first night and it bent one of the frame poles and, yeah, that was just game over. So it uh, wasn't ideal, but it uh, just means I've got to get a new one. But that's all right. Mate. These things happen. It's a costly trip. Mate, your poor wife's camper. She must be very, very upset with you right now, oh, mate. It's, it's, it's the hunting camper now. Mate. No, okay. Let's just right keep on. that one under wraps. So. <laughs> right. <on. laughs> but, yes, yeah, she came back and uh, when she's seen all these things, she's just going, this is Bloody expensive venison. Uh, <laughs> she's not happy it's about that It's the meat of one. kings. It's the meat of kings, Stella. <laughs> it's laced with gold. <laughs> but, no, mate, you get that. Oh, That's hunting. You, you get that. Ah, it is. It's, it's the reason I have a bull bar in the car because I'll tell you what, if I didn't, it, geez, it would have done some damage. No, that's it. That's but it. That's, it is what it is. It was a, uh, it was a fantastic trip. The camper worked bloody great. Found a couple of things I'm adding to it. Nice little shower tent. I bought that on the weekend and it's yep. just going to go up next to the shower part. And, um, yeah, re- and, hey, geez, I was nice and high away from those leeches that you boys were dealing with down there. The <laughs> yeah, well, well, unfortunately, that's all part of the experience when you go to hunt this campfire, unfortunately, Matt. But, yeah, in saying that, we are dry when we needed to be, so that's the important thing. But I know you were uh, trying out a new system for carrying stuff into the bush and I wanted to travel a little bit more lighter. So I thought I'd reach out to James from Blackfoot Design and see if you could make me a uh, stalker's vest. So in New Zealand, you see these boys going around where they've got these vests on where they're going out and they're, they're pigging and stuff like that. Um, you know, they've got a short sleeve a hoodie on and they've got pockets everywhere on them and I thought I wonder if James could do the same and James was very happy to step up to the task custom made me a prototype vest and yeah it actually worked really well for what I wanted it to do it held what I needed to hold there will be a couple modifications we're going to make to it but he's going to start making some molly bags as well which would be great to fit on the back of this this vest because I've got some molly webbing on the back of it but it held everything I needed it to hold, even with a couple of bottles of water in there, and fitted me perfectly. Um, he customized some zippers on the side, so when I sat down, it was comfortable to sit down. He put a nylon liner uh, at the back of it and made the tail a bit more longer, so when I sat down on that wet stump, 
I didn't get wet at all, which was fantastic. Yeah, that worked out really well. I was really, really happy with that and fit everything I needed it to fit in it. And I didn't have to carry such a large backpack. And it was much easier to maneuver and everything through the bush. So yeah, shout out to him. Thank you so much for making that. I look forward to using that in the, in the future. And yeah, can't wait to, to see what else he's going to do, to tell you the truth. Went up and met him and his lovely wife and kids. And yeah, he's very passionate about hunting and things like that. And I think even now he's coming back from a trip in Moorago. So. Yeah, he cut that one short. He's He was had pneumonia. So he was in uh, in hospital for a bit there. And now he uh, he went down there and then started feeling crook again. So he didn't end up getting Come out back. and hunting very oh, often, cool, which James. is a shame. So uh, best wishes there, James. Get better, mate. Hope you're uh, back out there soon. And yeah, joining definitely. us hopefully for a uh, a hunt later in the year. Yeah, no, need to get out, go chase some samba, I reckon. You did leave something out there. You left the taunting of myself when you visited James. The taunting? Oh yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't pretend like I didn't do anything. <laughs> oh yes, I remember. <laughs> yeah, I James showed me the footage of that deer. He zoomed it right in on his computer screen. And I have no doubt it is the same deer. I have no doubt whatsoever. I'm happy to go to the grave with backing that. No worries whatsoever. That is definitely the same deer. The one that is on Tristan's film and the one that he shot. I looked at it on the wall, had the extra tine down the front. It in same palm configuration, three spikes on the right-hand side. Uh, antler, nice palm on the left. That was. It's definitely... The same deer, in my opinion. In my opinion, I've moved on. There's a new buck thief. The rest of the community hasn't moved on, though. <laughs> uh, we might have to get Michael on to uh, tell us his side of the story at some stage. <laughs> Poor Michael's got to come in to defend himself. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, it's man. I, I've heard from James and heard from yourself about the idea of running this fest, and I'm very curious. And I actually didn't get to have a look at it. We just were busy down there, weren't we? Like it's we were, we were very busy. It's a full on couple of days. Like you, you're socialising and whatnot, but you're also out there to to hunt, and you're just in and out, in and out, and and you know doing the best you can. So I didn't actually get to see you wearing it or running it. So uh, it is something I'll have to check out next time we go out. But yeah, you were kind enough to lend me your Maroka 30 Wedgetail Bino harness. Yeah, it's pretty much a mini backpack for the front. Oh, it's it huge. <laughs> yeah. I love it. It's so good. Yeah, I've been running it since and appreciate you passing that over to us to, to play around with because a best probably Bino harness I've used, I will say that. The yeah. magnets are strong. I found that was an issue with a couple of other brands. Um that you'd lean forward, uh, the twin elements one, I think it is, or twin needle or whatever they're called, you'd lean forward and it just opened and you, your binos would fall out. Popped and they've out, got yeah. the, z- the zippers, which I'm not a fan of because they're making noise. So Hunter's Element is is not bad. It's it's probably better, but it's smaller. Maroka 30, quality, a lot of storage. It's got the pouches on there with it, which are not too small, so everything fits in really nicely. was able to get the GPS my Garmin 64 ST in there. Also get the rangefinder on the other side. Had another pack, another pouch at the front with a webbing on the front like a net. So I was able to put the wind indicator in that. So it's nice, easy to get to, to run in the front. I could run and have my knife or my callers. And then you've got a, a pouch underneath in the bottom as well. I didn't even use anything for that. That was yeah. for nothing oh. there. And then in the actual thing, you've got, Zip up pockets as well, so you put your keys in there. Or yep. I've found, yeah, just so many places. And the other thing I love about it, and I've I've got a, access to a little bunny block. Yeah, and uh, so I jumped out there and I took the thermal out, uh, my Hick Micro Griffin, just to play around with it realistically, and it fits easily in that bino harness. Yeah, they're quite large. They are. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> pretty much I, a I can run on both. Chest. Um, I will say that. So I ducked out there, and we got a uh, took a mate there, and we got we got a bunny there the other night. And then I was after foxes because I saw one in the day. I went there to chop some wood, and I <laughs> saw one there. So went yep. back trying to get this fox in. Thermal game changer. Jeez, it's great. But I've never used it during the day. And I went, you know what? I want to go have a bit of a play with it in the morning, and see what it's like 
in that first light sort of period. Wow. Wow. Eye <laughs> opening. Got, oh, man. So they've got a heap of ruse there and no tags, so no culling of them. Yep. I literally could see two of eight the thermal picked up all of them. Yep. Isn't it amazing, eh? I was That's sitting really there going, holy crap. How many animals am I not seeing? Just And these roos, they were just up against something back there, had no silhouette, just blended, and this thing just picked them up so easily. It was just like, wow, that's that's crazy. Now, that was early morning. I'm not sure what it's like the sort of, you know, later in the day, but that was cool. It was a real eye-opener to the point where I'm thinking maybe that is a good scanner in the state forest in that morning oh, yeah. session to see what is about. Because, yeah, maybe I'm missing some things, which I hey, guaranteed I'm missing things. You know, like I don't think anyone out there sees everything. So, yeah, oh, really they certainly interesting. have their place. They certainly have their place. There's a, I was watching one guy, a deer color in New Zealand, and he was training an indicating dog, and it was a Labrador, and it was indicating on this hillside, and it was full of tusket grass, and couldn't see anything on it. Put the thermal on it, and he, he could see three deer looking straight at him 50 meters away, and they're in the tusket looking straight at him. He took a photo of the dog indicating, can't see him, takes a picture through the thermal. There they are, clear as day you can see. So it's like yeah. turning on, near, near like turning on x ray machine sometimes. It's crazy. So good. Oh, I'm, I'm super impressed. I can't wait to play around with it more. Uh, yeah, it was awesome. Plus, just, just identification as well, being able to see. What yeah. you're looking at at so night. So looking at a pair of eyes actually making how to shape, a proper yeah. shape. Yeah, exactly. We didn't even spotlight, to be honest. We were walking around just with the thermal, just yeah. sort of glassing in night, and that's what it felt like and just going, all right, there's something there. Even if it was, you know, beautiful thing, I would say, if you're going to get one, get the rangefinder. Jeez, that's a, so good because it is hard to have that depth perception. I've heard that, yeah. I've heard that. Yeah, there was one there. I didn't know where it was. I think it was a fox now reflecting on it, but it just seemed further away. But I actually think it was closer than what it was than this rue. But, hey, like whatever, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, that being able to just hit the range finder, find out how far it is, awesome. We were able to get a, a bunny. It was pretty easy to see the bunny, probably about 60, 70 metres. Yeah, right. And know it's a rabbit and yep. range find, get in and, and we end up, Knocking him at, I think, about 40, 40 or 50 meters, I think it was nice. roughly. And yep. yeah, it was great. It was just like, this is so cool to play with. Like, I was more than happy. I didn't even pull the trigger. My mate did. And uh, I was just playing with the thermal. I had a great time. It was awesome. So, could not talk. I, I'm actually excited. I want to run it in the state forest now and see what I'm missing. Uh, now, here's the problem, though. In that morning, I really would have liked to have binoculars as well. Yep. Because I found, all right, there the ruse are, but I still can't see them with the naked eye. I'd love to then have the binos just to be able to look and see through as well because you don't have that depth perception with the thermal yep. um, as well. So is something, uh, but yeah, a bit of playing around with there, but, geez, it was good. Had had a real good time with that. No, that sounds like very, well, I reckon it would come in handy, especially if you're whistling foxes at night time. And if they're a bit shy of the spotlight, just scanning around, seeing when they come in and then – properly lining yourself up onto the fox before you even turn the spotlight on. And as soon as you stop him, turn the light on, bang, pot him. I reckon that that would make spotlight shy foxes a lot more easier, I reckon. Yeah. No, look, it, it would definitely be just – it's a game changer. Like it was so good just to be able to scan and know where something is so you could sort of sneak in on it to get a better look. Like it's – look, it's not a top-of-the-range one, so – identifying some things at a distance was a little tricky. I had a pretty good idea, but I wasn't 100%. But yep. you could sneak in a bit more. You, you knew there's a heat source there. You knew something's that way. So you just sneak in, get closer, have a look. Brilliant. I uh, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. No, good. And did you use any new, any other new gear on your trip? Uh, just the new setup, which I'm sort of thinking I'll probably – wasn't 100% happy with it. I love the way it spread the load. I will say that. I was able to yep. do a lot of Ks and it was comfortable. Yep. My only problem with it is that because you've got the bum bag that has shoulder straps, then you've got the small backpack that has shoulder straps, then you've got your bino harness which has shoulder straps. So you had sort of three. Now, it wasn't uncomfortable, but it was just like there's a lot going on there. 
So I'm sort of going to have a bit of a play there, I think, and work out what's another sort of way. But it worked really, really well. Like low profile, small, easy. Yeah, I don't know. Well, there's also those straps that you can put onto the backpack that attach yeah, for to the, the, harness. the harness as well. Yeah. So that does get another layer of uh, lacing off your body. Yeah. So that that's one. But, yeah, I, I liked the weight distribution. It was nice and comfy. Yep. was not like wearing a backpack. I found I enjoyed that, but just trying to work out. But I also think I can probably look at things and cut them down as well. Yeah, no. I I sit there and reflect and there was – for a rut and for what we thought was peak rut, there was no croaking going on up there. I heard one. I was That was probably the most disappointing part of the trip. Like everything else was fantastic. Couldn't speak more highly about it except that I heard one croak. I heard no reds roar which was devastating. That was, you know, I was so pumped to try and hear one. Uh, that's going to be our 2025 goal now, I think. But uh, the- well, Yeah, I was quite lucky to hear a red roar and a fellow croak. There was one uh, croaking just behind camp, the one that you went with Ian down the bottom there with Missy and found yep. all these scrapes. So he actually came into the back of camp one morning. He was croaking and Ian actually called him in. Oh wow! The very very first morning, actually called him in, and um, I woke up to croaking, and I first heard it about a hundred meters behind the tent, and then next thing I heard it was thirty meters from the tent. So I quickly jumped out to see what was happening, and found Ian calling this buck in. So that was pretty cool. And so I was sitting there watching that scrape where I'd spooked that uh, buck earlier in the week, and I heard a red roar down in the valley. And he actually came up and was actually using the wallow about 150 meters away from where I was sitting. And the worst thing about it was the wind was going from me to him. So I had if I moved the 100 meters forward to go around this little track to get to that spot, he would have winded me straight away. So I got to listen to a red roar and hear him wallowing. So that was quite interesting and That's quite cool. frustrating at the same time, Matt. So. <laughs> Hey, at least you heard it. I did hear. Look, I did hear that buck behind camp from the first morning, like the first night, at about three a.m. to four a.m. He croaked for about an hour and then just shut up shop. And yeah, yeah. That was I've never, I've never very heard him different. In the day there, yeah, very different compared to the last year in the snowies in Maragal North. It was much different. There was a lot more croaking going on. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, nothing coming into rattles, nothing coming into croaks. Very, I very feel. I, I, I personally feel the colder weather brings on the croaking more. Yeah, was, which uh, probably makes sense. I know yeah. you're tossing things up saying it was, you know, it was quite warm. This period has been quite warm. And, and the feedback, talking to a lot of people, the reds have been very quiet. Uh, the rut's been very weird. They'll go for a couple of days then just stop completely. It's been a very, very different rut and raw for, for both species. But then you, I talked to a couple of guys who were down. Uh, they got Maragal South in the ballot, and they just said it was croaking like crazy. It was going it was, off. It was going off. So it uh, it might very well be that little bit warmer up where we were in Nundal compared to down south maybe. I'm not sure. But then talking to a couple of blokes that were in uh, north, they said there wasn't the croaking going on as much. So it's just – Hit and miss, I think, and it is hit and miss. Unfortunately, that's part that's, of hunting. That's hunting. Yep, hundred percent, hundred percent. That's part of hunting. I, I was talking to another fellow, young Anthony, and he showed me his cameras that he had set up down this gully, and he even did a spreadsheet of all the photos and how they lined up and the dates and all the different bucks that he was surveilling. And there was one day, I think it was the thirteenth and fourteenth of March. And I was looking at the temperature on his camera, and the temperature didn't go up 14 degrees that day. It was his busiest day over those two days. It was his, the busiest time. There was five different bucks, I believe, come into those scrapes, and you could see them actively in the scrape, moving around, and you could see a couple of them calling out as well. And that was a month earlier to when we were there. But once again, that's cemented for me when it's really cold. <laughs> I think that they're more active running mm. and, um, and calling. Yeah, no, I think you're right there. I think that was one of the things that was getting tossed around as to why it was so quiet. But then a lot of people were saying on the private that they could hear him going off their heads. So it's just a, oh, just one of those things, right place, right time sometimes. And 
is what it is. It's, oh, it's uh, all part of the fun. It is. Oh, man. You know what? I had so much fun up there. It was, uh, again, big shout out to the boys because they made it such a good trip and there was a lot of fun going on, a lot of good conversations, people just bouncing ideas off each other. Like that was invaluable. Like I I had a really, really good time. Yeah, no, I, I got to experience so many good things during the time spent in the camp. So many new guys were there. People from previous years were there too, and everyone puts their best foot forward and things like this, and it's great to see. Like I even, uh, young Adam uh, shot this young buck, and he wanted to do a, uh, a Euro mount, but upon taking the head off this tear, he's shot it in the low neck, but the 270 has skirted up the neck and come out the pretty much just below the eye socket of the skull. Uh, yep. The deer has died instantly, which is great, but... Didn't give us too much to work with as he wanted a Euro <laughs> mount. So um, once we found that, well, actually, I got to use this Havlon blade. And I, like you, have now been marked by the Havlon blade. Oh, they're dangerous. And so uh, I didn't require any stitches, though, which is great. Well, better than I did. <laughs> but, uh, oh, but unfortunately, uh, they, after using it, I realized that they'd be extremely good for caping out deer. Fantastic for that. Uh, breaking down a deer, I don't think I'd be using them, unfortunately. I think I'd stick to my Vitrinox. But uh, even taking that skin off, we was showing Adam what to do there, and then we he did have a recipro saw, and we were able to take the top of the cap off, which he's now going to mount on his wall. I actually sent a photo of it today. It looks pretty bloody epic, actually. Nice. So kudos to him. And just another experience. I got to have another person. It was fantastic. Well, that, that's what I enjoyed. People, yeah, as you said before, you touched on it, you know, sharing the – the joy of someone's successful hunt when they're coming back into camp with it. And it was just great, like people coming back and talking and then the strategy and the theory and this is where I'm going and bouncing those ideas off each other. That was awesome. Just good chat to the point where I think I want to do something similar and run a bit of a camp and and get a few people around. And just I noticed that everyone had something to – even if – you know, I'm not super experienced, but being able to chat to other people that were more or less experienced and just bounce ideas off each other and it's it's what you're there for. And I love talking about hunting, hence why I do the podcast. And yeah. just getting to go and meet people and chat about hunting and then go out hunting, man, how can that not be a winner? So it's something I want to look at doing as I well. I think it's great therapy. Uh, and every I think every hunter should do one in their lifetime. Yeah, it was it's good great fun. therapy. Really I, I, good I enjoy fun. it. Just talking to Heaps of new people about different things, different theories, as you said before, bouncing ideas and just, you know, taking back something back home, That that's even better. That's even better in my opinion. Yeah, no, I loved it. Well, talking about taking something back home, there was a – geez, you'd been training and not physically. It was dessertly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, made the uh, apple pie – Moonshine with the apple crumble uh, and custard dessert, and that uh, that got me the Zolio, which I was quite happy about. So for people that might not have known about Hunt Care, they got a lot of sponsors behind them, the boys, and which was great. And there was a couple of really good prizes there, one being, well, there was two Zolios up for grabs. That's correct. And yeah. one was for there was a dessert comp and then one was first buck or biggest buck i think it was biggest yeah, buck. it was uh biggest buck uh first deer in camp got the knives which uh michael got yep for that spy car and uh yeah then there was the boris drop time no was it drop time the binoculars the drop yeah the binoculars anyway and that that went to young arthur he was yeah, he's a bloody great cook, young Arthur. And he's really handy with a knife too. Like, breaks down deer, fantastic. Like he was really good. He really enjoyed the weekend. You could see him breaking up the deer, and kudos to him, like showing all the the new fellows how to do stuff. It was really good to to watch someone with his experience pass that on. But yeah, he won the best um, dessert, and I got second prize, which was the Zolio, which I was over the moon about. I was so happy about that, and um, yeah, brought brought that home and. I'm um, looking forward to – it comes with a subscription as well, so I'm looking forward to getting onto that. And, um, yeah, it just you – know, I've got a lot of local state forests close to me, so just being able to go into them and still be able to chat with the missus, let her know where I am. She can see her aim at all times. Just that safety aspect puts her mind at ease and that it, and uh, just her able to still um, talk to me and things like that, that re- re- really – it's going to really help out 
in me being able to get out there a lot more, especially doing afternoon or morning sessions. Yeah, oh, look, I thoroughly liked using it, being able to chat to other people on the Zolio, being able to speak to the wife, um, just touch base. Uh, the plans are pretty good. You can pause them after I think the first three months and there's different plans for how much you want to use it. Yeah, look, I think it's a really good system. Connects up to the phone super easy through the app and then you're just good to go. I thought it was great just to have a play with it and getting the opportunity to play with it as well because, How's as I said that? at the start, I don't know if I was sold on it, but then after getting my hands on it and playing with it going, this is great, just yep. you know, hooked it up to the backpacks, charge-wise, lasted ages, super easy to use. I've got the phone on me anyway for using a Venza. Man, what a win. Oh, definitely. I, I was And their price point's pretty good. Three three seventy five, oh, I think. Oh, yeah. It's pretty much the same as a PLB, but this thing here you can do so much more with it. It's not just one button and there's heaps of things you can do yeah. with it. Talk to emergency services, say what's going on. Yeah, no, nah, look, I I'm uh, I'm sold. It's definitely on the wish list now. It's um really good bit of gear. So congrats, yeah. mate. Well done getting it. And I will say the apple pie moonshot, I'm not a dessert person. If you know me, I'm not a dessert person. Literally yeah. never eat it. Uh, and the opposite of my wife who got up me because she's like, how did you not try his dessert? And I was like, I, just, I don't, dessert's not me. I don't ever eat it. <laughs> um, I will say that I do like to have a, a drink and that apple moonshine, oh, man, that was good. Tastes just like apple pie in a can. Oh, it was beautiful. That, so oh, massive props to that and, and good on you for winning this all. Yeah, that was well uh, well deserved because I know you'd been trying very hard and perfecting it and you, a bit of a – how you had to cook your little custard pie or whatever it was, apple oh, pie. Yeah. <laughs> <Straight> <laughs> oh, yeah. So I had to make it from scratch and got to throw it inside. The had to be cooked over a fire and like, it rained as well. So that made it even more interesting. But uh, and then your tray thankful. wasn't was too big. You had to yeah, pull so that I had to fold pie. that in oh, and make that fit. And oh, yeah, it was just it, it worked in the end. It worked in the end, and that's that's all that mattered. It got there. It was just that's the aim of it. So that worked out well. And yeah, no. It, it's a really good bit of kit. I was really excited to even be able to use it. And it sold me on the idea I was going to buy one anyway. Even if I didn't win one, I was going to buy one straight afterwards. And the, as the wife explained to me, for an extra $17, I probably could have just bought one to triff outright instead of buying all the ingredients to make the, the, moon, <laughs> the apple pie moonshine and the, um, and the uh, apple crumble. But it definitely come in handy. Had to send an emergency SOS to uh, Cousin Anthony. Told him I forgot the fettuccine pasta to go with the sauce and he was able to bring that <laughs> into camp so that was that was fantastic that saved that saved a, a, a night's worth of uh, food which was which was good so yeah no bloody great bit of kit and uh that in the vest yeah i think i'm nearly home and hosed with me uh me set up mate i uh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna try on the next hunt a little bit different i think i'll run a new pack. I've got that ridge line. I think it's like a 35 or 45 liter. Yep. So I might run that instead of the the waist belt and the 12 liter pack or I'll try and down size a lot of my stuff. For the next one, I'm not going to be taking, you know, my rattle pack. I'm not going to be taking a few things like that. So I keep taking my shooting sticks out with me and I think it's just pointless. I don't ever use them. Like I just I just find I'm either looking for a rest or going freestanding. So I'm sort of sitting there going, oh, I might pull them out. There is things there that I can just pull. Like I've got gloves. I, I sort of always like to have a little bit more just in case, but yeah. I'm starting to go, you know what, they've been in the pack for a bit now. I haven't used them. Yes, keep the first aid gear. Yes, this, all the safety stuff, but there are things I can that are – I don't need to have them in the pack, but I do yeah. like to have them in the pack. Things so that you can do without sometimes. Yeah. Even, it, it also depends on your hunting strategy too. If you go, go that particular day, like <laughs> that buck that I missed, um, I reckon having a shooting stick would have helped out phenomenally in that situation. Yeah. But you know, you don't know when you're going to use a thing. If you're going to, if you're sitting down there overlooking a scrape, and you have time to slap your shooting stick with a rifle on it ready to go, hey, great. If you're there stalking through timber and moving through a lot then you know maybe you don't have to use the stick so it really depends on what type of hunting you're going to be doing the day pretty much that was the other thing i didn't like about the system i was running it doesn't have the connecting points to run my qr0 the maroka 30 qr0 sling yep i love that thing just not having to hold the rifle all the time now yep. i was running this stalker sling but nowhere near as good um right. i like it but 
yeah, not as not as good as the the zero because you just your hands are free, the weight goes through the pack, so you're not it's not on you. Whereas I found obviously the stalker slings on your shoulder, it's just another piece as well of what I had on there. So it's all trade offs, and I think you're it right. It's all trade offs, exactly right. I think yeah. I might start running different things. So if I'm exploring, I might run the little 12 liter and the bum bag because that's just really nice to walk with. So I might even see if I can downsize a little bit of that and get rid of one of them or, or whatnot. And then the other one is once I've explored and I'm just stalking, that could be the way to go, running a pack with the QR Zero. So it's look, it's trial and error, bit of fun, bit of playing. I like that stuff too. Like even... Every time I go out for the hunt, just reflecting on my gear, what could be better. Uh, yeah, fine all tuning. Those things. It is. Fine tuning is a big thing. I'm loving the Ticker Aspire 308. That's a yeah. brilliant rifle. It's a good bit of kit. It's a nice rifle. It's very nice. I do really, really like the Zero Tech scope I've got on there. In low light, man, value for money, I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's definitely. I've got two zero techs now and I'd rate both of them. I'm yeah, really nice. impressed. So I'm happy with the rifle setup now. Nice weight, good two and a half by 15, good range. Oh, yeah, couldn't be happier with the rifle. Now, yeah, a little bit of tweaking still or maybe a couple more trips just to get used to it and see see if it gets a little bit better or, or whatnot first and, yeah, play it by ear. But that's part of the fun. Like oh, it's, it's it all part of it. Working it out, have, coming up with these ideas. Ah, oh, it's good. <laughs> Keeps you on your toes, that's for sure. And the scope was mounted well. Didn't it shoot sideways? No, look, I know that's a bit of a stab at your cousin. He did a great <laughs> job. He helped us mount it. I know you talked me into it because I've got all the gear here and I was like, oh, I'm just going to mount it myself. I've never had an issue mounting them. And then you started telling me he's got all these little fancy bits of equipment. And I was like, oh, now I'm curious. So, no. He it's lives pretty gear. close, so I, I shot up there and got him to uh, walk us through the whole thing. And uh, no, he did he did very well. Came up perfect, shooting very nicely. I'm super happy. So uh, thanks, Anthony. I know you're listening, and uh, we'll get you on the podcast soon because there's a few things that I want to talk to you about with uh, your cousin here. Who? Oh god. Yeah, it's coming. No one wants to hear him. You got to, you're gonna have to get a smaller microphone. <sighs> Mate, some of the comments in the Facebook chat. <laughs> How good's the chat? How good's the hard cat chat. chat? It's mainly just watching you two pick each other apart. <laughs> I am of the mind to get you both on here and I'll just mute my microphone and let you two go at it because it is good to watch and listen to. I'm telling you that much. Between the uh, the banter from you two is absolutely fantastic. Are you paying you out today about missing that buck that was so close? Yeah, Ed. yeah, no. and he's going through all the phases of being snow, one of Snow White's dwarfs and like, <laughs> a, like taking to look over the the wallow for a red deer and he just starts sneezing because he's getting hay fever and <laughs> told me he's to shove his two fingers up his nose and shut up before I put him in the wallow himself. And But, but I wouldn't have anyone else next to me. I'd rather I'd rather have him sneeze next to me than anyone else, to be honest with you. Or sleeping. Been, Don't forget for, him falling oh, asleep. Oh, yeah, and sleeping as well. Yeah, we are on this track and there was heaps of deer walking past the front centre. So oh, his idea was, was just sit up here and we'll wait. And so just waiting there and I thought, you know, I thought, Jane was sitting behind me. I thought she was snoring, and I, I gave her a bit of an elbow jab, and the snoring didn't stop. And I'm like, "What's going on?" So I picked up my phone and just put on reverse and looked behind me, and here he is, old, old sleepy, just sitting down on the having a nod, <laughs> having a good old nod. <laughs> uh, but kudos, Steve. It sounded like someone trying to start a chainsaw, so it didn't send out a place inside the forest. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, no, he's good humor, and uh, yeah, no, well, yeah, we've grown up shooting together, and I, I've been shooting next to him for over thirty years now, and like it's, yeah, we just we we, we gel together like chalk and cheese, and we can we know we know how far we can push each other, yeah. So <laughs> it did it did take him, you know, two weeks before he started paying me out for that shot because he knew it was very raw, <laughs> very, <laughs> just after it happened. But now we can sit back and joke about it, and yeah, it's all jovial now. So yeah, no, nah. it's yeah. all part of it. I mean, you're not, you're not going to shoot every single deer you see. So these no. things happen. And the way I see it is you're getting eyes on deer, getting to shoot. Jones coming along really well. Man, there's so many positives to take out of it. 
Oh, so yeah, it's, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it's just, all wins. You can't let one bad thing ruin your whole week, that's for sure. But it just makes you hungry for more. It makes yeah. you hungry for more. So Yeah, couldn't agree more. No, it was a ripper time. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, thanks to the boys for putting it on. And mate, we'll, uh, I'm looking forward to getting out again shortly. Yeah, no, great time, um, the great people, and just the fact that it's free and anyone's able to, anyone was able to access this that we wanted to, and just the amount of knowledge being passed around from person to person, just what an absolute bloody great week! I like, wish I was still there, that's for sure. No, I'll uh, I'll second that. I had an absolute blast. So thanks uh, to the boys at the Hunters Campfire, Jono, Ian. And Mark, uh, organising everything, a lot goes into it and uh, no, it was a ripper. So thanks, boys. Well done. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate that and uh, I learned a lot and it was great to meet up in person. So um, thoroughly enjoyed that. And look, I am disappointed I wasn't there when you got bogged. That would have just really <laughs> just, you know, really just added, added to the week. <laughs> Fair dinkum. Fair dinkum. Fair a man's got to get bogged once in his life, so I'm glad I was around friends one happened. That's for sure. uh, I'm just glad the footage was there. We might even put that up on the socials. No, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time. Bye for now. Cheers, guys. If you have a topic, guest, question, or any gear that you want to hear about on the podcast, shoot us an email, australianhuntingandbeyond at gmail.com. Alternatively, Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. All the links are in the show notes. If you haven't already, make sure you give us a review and subscribe to our podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. Thanks for joining us, and we'll catch you next time.